Good afternoon. Hello. Welcome to session four. This is Leveraging Nature and Mitigating Potential Threats to Water Quality. My name is Terry Carta, and I'm the Executive Director of Jamaica Bay Rockaway Parks Conservancy. Thank you all for being here, and thank you to our speakers. Um, this session, um, sorry, one second. We know that there is a strong interest in understanding how nature-based solutions could work in the region as well as the efforts on nature as a result of the proposed measure. We're joined today by Pippa Brashier, Resilience Principal at SCAPE Landscape Architecture, and Dr. Philip Orton, Research Associate Professor, Professor at Stevens Institute of Technology. And they are here today to help us understand the extent to which nature can protect our communities from flooding, how the proposed measures in Alternative 3B may impact the ecology of the region, and what this means for water quality. As a reminder, um, questions about both presentations will be answered at the end of the session, and you can submit your questions through the Q&A feature um, at the bottom of your screen. Um, and also as a reminder, the full agenda for the day and information about the speakers can be found on Rebuild by Design's webpage, um, and the link to that, uh, that page will again be dropped in the chat momentarily. Um, and then finally, uh, as an added resource, the Army Corps of Engineers has compiled a very helpful glossary of terms that can be found by following the other link that will appear in the chat momentarily. So thank you again for being here. And with that introduction, I will turn it over to Pippa. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, here we go, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Pepper Brashear. I am the Resilience Principal at uh, SCAPE Landscape Architecture, and I'm trying Just a moment, it looks like she may be frozen. Thanks everyone for your patience. We'll be right back. Bill, do you want to start? And then we yeah. can go back to Pippa. Great. Sure. One sec. Thanks for jumping in. I'll share my screen. I don't think it matters too much the order. I hope that I'm not totally ready. All right, I'll ask you to let me know if I get into it. Is it showing presenter view or am I only seeing presenter view? You're good. Great. All right, let me get a pointer. All right, so I'm Philip Borton. I'm a research professor at Stevens Institute. Um, I'm a background in physical oceanography and uh, um, flood risk. I'm one of the people behind storm surge forecasting that you might see the Stevens Flood Advisory System, also a member of the New York City Panel on Climate Change since 2013, uh, mapping flooding from monthly tidal flooding up to extreme event, 100 year floods um, that you may have seen, um, looking at flood risk and also been really involved in adaptation uh, research over the past decade since Hurricane Sandy for the region. My, my funding in recent years has been uh, mostly from NOAA and National Science Foundation, the NOAA project. Uh, projects are through the National Estuarine Research Reserve that I'll mention, and then also through the Consortium for Climate Risk in the Urban Northeast, part of, part of now of what was called RESA, but now the Climate Adaptation Partnerships Program. All right, so I'll speak about water quality effects and migrating organism effects briefly. I'm, I'm more of a physical oceanographer, but I do have a, a master's degree in addition to my PhD in physical oceanography. I have a master's degree in marine science. So I have some expertise on these, but I'm also gonna sort of be drawing on expertise from a wider consortium of scientists who have been involved in the research with me. And then lastly, I'll speak about something I've worked on a lot, which is opportunities um, for leveraging nature to reduce coastal flooding, more, more looking at novel opportunities um, that haven't been investigated. Okay, what I mentioned about this consortium uh, that I'm a part of, uh, I um, obtained funding thanks to uh, the Hudson River Nairs um, partners like Sarah Fernald, um, who played a role, um, received some funding to study the estuary effects of storm surge barriers if they were to be built on the Hudson um, from 19, 2019, 
um, the we had a, some different workshops, a project scoping workshop, um, a scientific workshop called Surge Barrier Environmental Effects and Empirical Experience, and then a final scoping workshop. We, and, and those were more um, by invite, but pretty broad um, stakeholder workshops where we were um, getting input on what people were concerned about with storm surge barriers if they were on the Hudson. Um, and then that environmental effects and empirical experience workshop had invited scientists from the UK and another Dutch scientist and what we were looking for there and then a lot of different researchers from the area um, and public uh, stakeholders from government mainly other than that and nonprofits. Um, what we were looking for there was to learn about, you know, the empirical experience from prior barriers being built in other countries, um, because there's very little, there, there is a lot of evidence that these surge barriers can be effective for reducing flooding, as you've heard already, but there's not a lot of before and after really detailed environmental studies. So we're looking for that, that kind of information, um, and, and we learned a lot. Um, and some of the main topics of interest were Beyond that were um, the surge barrier effects on migrating organisms. Um, that's a harder one to understand and, and there, there often hasn't been much data on, on migrating organisms before and after surge barriers have been built in prior decades. Many of them were built like the Thames barrier many decades ago. Um, and then the potential surge barrier effects on tidal wetlands, which require storm surge and flooding in order to get sedimentation in, in certain cases. Um, or they can require a river flood in the case of the Hudson, um, which isn't affected by the storm surge barrier. Okay, and one thing that we've been working on recently, which is a paper um, that lays out a research agenda on rest estuary impacts is just worth briefly mentioning. Um, this is sort of a group of, uh, of those researchers who interacted on, on, in this project um, where we're trying to put it into a peer reviewed publication. Um, and, uh, and the title is Increased Utilization of Storm Surge Barriers a research agenda on estuary impacts. And one thing I'll um, mention, um, you know, throughout that project, we interacted with the Corps of Engineers and I, especially Bryce Weismiller and Kyle McKay most frequently, and then others also. And I, I definitely felt that they were as interested as, as the scientists in understanding, um, you know, the topics such as ecosystem impacts and water quality. Um, and I do wanna, you know, and that impressed me. And I do wanna congratulate them in the New York district for and all the collaborators, including the Colonel who we saw earlier, on a pretty impressive effort to get, you know, on a timeline, get the HAT study, um, this present draft report done. Um, it's very detailed and thorough, and I've been and re been reading a lot of it, um, thousands of pages of, of reports. So I think it's very impressive, and I think people who are concerned about flooding can be, um, you know, uh, happy with the fact that there's all this effort, you know, is being focused on this topic uh, and a fairly capable way to at least you know um so but but as people know i might be a little more of a critic and now you know come to some um criticisms in a few cases of of what they could do better um so in terms of water quality oxygenation uh, and meaning by that term oxygenation of the water you hear the term hypoxia for example or anoxia meaning no oxygen um algal blooms pathogens the questions that people asked and we were given these questions beforehand one was, what are the water quality risks related to HATS, the Harbor and Tributary Study, which I'll refer to from now on as HATS. How will combined sewer overflows be dealt with? Um, and we've already heard that today. Um, just taking some, some of the report, uh, you know, the effects and consequences of the alternative plans, they, they found that the impacts to dissolved oxygen were anticipated to have a impact rating sort of in a qualitative scale of low to moderate. Um, impacts to turbidity, similarly low to moderate, um, and that could be from building these barriers um, in the waterways out to the operation of them in future decades. Um, the, so, so I think that that's the short answer. Um, there will be more research done on these, as, as was mentioned earlier. This is the tier one EIS at this point. Um, the physical obstruction to flows when barriers are open is is being, you know, I think that these impacts aren't large. Um, there, yesterday, Dave Ralston gave a talk at Hudson River Foundation where he compared it, some of the initial impacts on the physical conditions to be similar to the dredging project that occurred um, over the past, uh, you know, since 2000, year 2000, the deepening of the shipping channels. So because they have a lot of gates and a lot of open flow area for the tides, um, they're not really dramatically reducing the physical or changing the physical conditions. And so the, the water quality impacts aren't expected to be um, dramatic uh, you know, or large, but, um, but so far they've rated them as low to moderate. Um, 
the closures, of course, are much more extreme, acute, but short-term effect. And we have a publication coming out um, very soon. It just got accepted on what happens when you close the barriers. If they were to be built on the Hudson, actually, we were looking throughout that study more at the Hudson barriers. Um, they, they, they temporarily prevent flushing of pollutants. There was some research already done by the um, New York City DEP looking at Jamaica Bay. Um, and they looked at, you know, if there's a longer, you know, any accompanying storm-driven rainfall, of course, is trapped temporarily. And that's, um, there could be CSOs um, with sewage pathogens. Um, and that was one of the concerns. If there was a longer term closure, uh, they looked at, you know, short term closures and then also a four day long closure. Um, and that would require a very long term sort of storm surge event in addition to rainfall. Then that could be, uh, that, that could be a concern that you, you would have very high pathogen concentrations. Um, and, you know, one topic that comes up a lot is this, you know, whether or not the water levels from the from a river that are trapped behind, say, Jamaica Bay or the Hackensack maybe is a really good question. You know, how, um, you know, how much of a chance is there of flooding from those the, the fresh water that gets trapped behind a closed barrier? We studied that for the Hudson and we found that it didn't, um, you know, it wouldn't be, uh, it would be very unlikely to increase, to cause flooding behind the barriers because the delay uh, between the rainfall and the Hudson running off versus when the storm surge occurs. Now in the Hackensack, it's a much smaller watershed. I think that would need to be studied. And I think these, these are being studied, um, but that is an important question also. Um, and, and as already mentioned, more detailed modeling of some of these topics is, is planned in the coming phases of, of the HAP study. In terms of pollution and public health, um, one of the questions, at, two of the questions were, Public health effects of closing gates in areas that have contaminated fill and adjacent Superfund sites. And then also somebody asked to clarify public health risks of flooding by polluted waters. Um, the, the limited things I can say on this because I'm more of an oceanographer and a, and a flood hazard specialist are that, uh, and, and this is also based on my interaction with all these other scientists, the potential, you do have to balance the potential pollution risk from the surge barriers, you know, trapping water behind them to the potential pollution risk of the storm surge that's coming in. Of course, we learned um, during Hurricane Sandy that a lot of contaminants are, um, and pathogens get into people's homes um, when there is flooding. Um, so if there is no flooding because you've, you've closed barriers, then that could be a, a net positive. It could actually reduce the exposure of people to contaminants. So you've got to balance those two things. Um, small scale surge barriers on Newtown Creek and Gowanus are an interesting example, or even Kilba and Cole when you've got the Passaic River nearby a Superfund site also, um, and, and a lot of Arthur Kill also, I guess, too, um, that you, there, there will need to be a lot of careful research uh, on the rain runoff um, in general behind these barriers to understand how much pumping is needed because pumping is needed to get water out uh, so that it doesn't pile up and go on us that all this polluted water isn't piling up from he if there's heavy rainfall coincident with a storm surge. So, so that is something that needs to be studied more. Um, and, and plan for and put into the cost planning. Um, another important concern with the surge barriers that was shown in, in this presentation yesterday, I think you could probably get it at HudsonRiver.org um, on their website at some point. Uh, Dave Ralston's talk was on sediment transport around a surge barrier. And that and there's a lot of um, erosion in the areas around the surge barrier, even kilometers away, there's enhanced erosion. And that could lead to Remobilization of contaminated sediments in some of these areas, and I think uh, I think that might have even been mentioned by Brace earlier that that's a um, that that's a concern. All right, moving on to ecological impacts. The question uh, that was asked, or the general question, is how will ecological biodiversity and habitat connectivity be addressed through this project? Um, there's just one topic of concern for me here, um, and, and I'll defer the rest to the Corps of Engineers and, and their reports. Um, there is the um, NIBEM uh, model, which is sort of uh, a little bit more on the qualitative, qualitative side of um, predicting a lot of different environmental effects. Um, but that model doesn't yet have any ecosystem connectivity built into it. It just looks at localized changes in salinity, velocity, um, but it doesn't yet look at the connectivity of ecosystems. So migrating organisms is still a, a big concern. When you have surge barriers like this one, and I'm not sure if this is a I think any of these are preliminary designs, but there's these auxiliary flow gates that um, are just meant for increasing the tidal flow. And then you've got your navigation gates. Um, the currents are typically in any study, the, the Ralston study that was presented at Hudson River Foundation or the Corps of Engineers um, work shows that with this amount of open uh, openness to tidal flow, 
um, which is more than 50% open cross-sectional area, you still have an enhancement or an increase in the flood and the tide currents of almost double. Um, so when you have very strong currents through these, through these gates and eddying and um, stronger turbulence, that could be a detriment to migrating menhaden or um, I imagine striped bass. I think bigger fish are probably less likely to be interfered with. But, you know, marine mammals, in the case of the Dutch, um, one of the locations we learned about in that workshop was that um, I think sea lions were one or one um, marine mammal, you know, fairly large that avoided crossing the, the boundary of those barriers. But it didn't have navigation gates. It just had a lot of smaller um, auxiliary type gates. Um, and the marine mammal sea lions formed two different populations, one in the bay that didn't leave and one offshore. So, so you can even have impacts on larger marine mammals. And these are just not very well understood um, topics yet. So that's something that uh, the HATS 22, 2022 report said, modeling um, of the migratory patterns uh, and other structures um, such as surge barriers will occur in the tier two environmental impact statement later on. Okay, and then a fundamental concern that's you know come up, and I know the core is um, cognizant of this, and it's even uh, explained in their report. Um, and and they look at a future where sea level rise leads to um, increasing need for barrier closures. And we heard a little bit about this so far today, but just a good demonstration of this is the New Bedford hurricane barrier in Massachusetts, which in spite of there being no increase in the number of hurricanes being nearby, has been used in, at an increasing rate over. Uh, the many decades that it's been in, in place. Um, and there were never any constraints put on that, the barriers used that, well, I'm not sure if there were or not, but but it's not, um, it, it's being used more and more frequently uh, and basically in, in response to increased flooding due to sea level rise. And that's a pretty common thing. That's the same thing with the Thames barrier. I mean, it's very useful and it's, um, and it's also, um, as, as uh, Luce explained, it's being sort of adaptively managed to where they have um, a system that will continue to work going forward into the future. But, but the, uh, that's a, a serious concern um, is that you'll have increasing closures and, and the impacts on the physical environment of open barriers are, as I said, relatively modest, but the impact of a closure is very acute and, and strong. Um, if it's only a rare closure and the system can recover, because you only close once a year, which is typically what's um, what's stated in the planning, once a year or less, then that's um, not like you know it's not likely to be uh, as much of a problem. But if you start closing it monthly to prevent chronic flooding, then that's a serious concern. Um, so when a barrier is built, there will be you know it's putting off these future decisions about what to do about chronic flooding. Um, it may temporarily, and neighborhoods that have chronic flooding right now are, will not be protected by these barriers. I think that's really important to understand. Um, they won't be closing the barrier on a monthly basis, most likely. Although I think that might be TBD for places in Jamaica Bay that are on these very narrow um, canals in the northern part of, part of Jamaica Bay. I'm not sure what their plans are there, but they do have local tide gates as some local risk reduction um, features. But um, for the most part, these aren't intended to be used more than once a year. Um, so you'll have that decision between protecting property or raising neighborhoods and putting in these additional expenditures in future decades um, or non-structural measures to address that chronic flooding instead. Um, so that, that, that puts off those decisions to later. All right, so the last part of my presentation is on um, novel you know, ideas for leveraging nature. Um, the, the 2019 Harbor and Tributaries Interim Report had a quote you know, about the government agency workshops that in general, multi-benefit solutions with natural or nature-based features are preferred. Um, I think you can say that also about a lot of, there's a lot of people who prefer them, although definitely not, uh, maybe not even a majority, might, you know, um, but there are a lot of people who would prefer to see nature-based solutions where possible. One of the questions we got was, can we use nature-based infrastructure in dense areas like Manhattan to withstand storm surge? Um, the answer to that is, you know, in deep water harbors without much um, space out on the water, um, things like wetlands, cannot reduce storm surge very much, if, if at all. You need tens of kilometers of wetland with, with a storm surge flowing over it to have the level of friction that can reduce flooding. So it's a real challenge, and, and, um, and I, that's generally what the Corps of Engineers has concluded. It's a very big challenge to use nature-based solutions to stop storm surges. Um, but uh, there are some exceptions to that. Um, which we've demonstrated. So 
um, a limited set of widely known nature-based features was considered by the Corps, and none were expected significantly to reduce storm surge. I shouldn't say a limited set. I mean, about 10 different nature-based solutions was considered, oyster reefs, um, tidal wetlands, et cetera. Um, features like vegetation and oysters, their solution is because they either break waves, the wind-driven waves, and that can be helpful on a smaller spatial scale, or they, over large distances, they can create enough frictional drag to reduce the storm surge and um, yeah, requiring large swaths of area, you know, like tens of kilometers. Um, the two areas in Jamaica Bay where these frictional effects could be feasible for reducing storm surge are Jamaica Bay and the Meadowlands. And, and both um, have gates, storm surge gates in the tentatively selected plan. Um, now what we, what my research and others I've been collaborating with have introduced is uh, novel estuary scale nature-based solutions such as undredging a shipping channel, for example, and, and, or narrowing an inlet to replicate historical um, bay systems. And I'll show more details on what, what I mean by that. Um, so it's sort of a deep restoration of the bathymetry um, of an estuary, such as Jamaica Bay. Or in the case of the Meadowlands, you can imagine that there's these huge floodplains that have been cut off in order to make room for very important um, areas of trucking and other things that relate to the port. Um, but in the long run, are we going to have groundwater flooding that starts making, you know, requiring pumping of these huge swaths of land? And is that really a long term um, use of that of those properties? So I'm not sure if it's really been investigated what the long term benefit could be of blowing out a lot of those levees in, in the Meadowlands. So I think these are two cases where estuary scale nature based solutions haven't been studied and, and they could be studied. Um, so, the, you know, these ideas go back all the way to um, Edgar mentioned the SRR study that led to the report, A Stronger, More Resilient New York, in 2013, um, modeling by Arcadis with myself and others, um, Pippa and others also who are on this call. Um, we, we looked at um, how you might modify the bathymetry of Jamaica Bay and, and reduce flooding. Uh, in Rebuild by design, design, we came back and did it again, but we were sort of told, well, don't focus on that with your final design plan, which ended up being living breakwaters, um, because Jamaica Bay is a very complicated place in terms of policy and all the different stakeholders. So, so we were kind of pushed away a little bit. In 2015, I published a paper on channel and inlet shallowing as mitigation and basically taking them back to historical depths as a mitigation method for storm tides. And then in the past um, four years, I've been working with a, with a group of different scientists from four different universities. Uh, with funding from National Science Foundation to look at this general topic and around the United States. Um, and then a few more papers have been published that I'll show some details from in a moment in 2020 and 23. So, so to the core's um, you know, defense, this is all things that have come up in the past decade. And I think the Corps of Engineers works with more standard toolboxes that have been sort of approved and used and demonstrated in other places. So this is fairly new ideas. Um, so looking at Jamaica Bay, I think the key issues for Jamaica Bay that lead to flooding, and Jamaica Bay is sort of the center point of the most common flooding in the region, including chronic tidal flooding of some a few neighborhoods. It's that we have low-lying neighborhoods surrounding the bay that are that were built on landfill, including airports, Floyd Bennett Field originally and now Kennedy Airport, which is actually fairly high elevation on that airport property. You've got sea level rise, um, which is a, certainly a big part of the problem, and it's leading to accelerating tidal flooding. And lastly, you have this amplification of high tides. The monthly high tide is nearly a foot higher than the monthly high tide, or otherwise known as spring tide at Manhattan. Um, so the dredging of the harbor actually actually hasn't really changed the tides very much. And that's been studied by, by my colleagues, including Dave Ralston. Um, but Jamaica Bay is this, and that's because it's a river. And so the tide propagates up um, the Hudson. And whereas, but, and, and it was also always a very open system at, you know, dredging, Ambrose Channel, which is a fairly narrow channel, um, really hasn't changed the tides in that er in those areas. But Jamaica Bay has very large amplified tides. Also, the Hackensack has amplified tides, so some of the bigger tides in the area. One other place here that stands out like an elephant in the room is Long Island Sound. Long Island Sound naturally has a resonance to it that leads to very high tides that have always been there. And so developments in Long Island Sound tend to be more elevated and they don't have as much, they don't have much of a chronic flooding problem in Long Island Sound. But so these are the three things that lead to the flooding of Jamaica Bay. So, so what we've done over the past you know, eight years is 
create a model. This is collaborative work with Eric Sanderson, published in 2020, creating a model of Jamaica Bay of the 1870s. We actually have tied observations um, um, that we can validate that model with. It had a very narrow inlet, um, a lot more shallow areas, um, sort of replete with sediment. Um, now we've got a blown, basically the, it was converted into a port. I'm having advanced issues. Um, it was converted into a port, um, but never used as a port. There, there I think is one um, ship that has a very deep hole, which is the DEP um, ship that goes out maybe once per day. Um, and then there's other, otherwise there's fuel barges and such. So it's really not a port. Um, so it may be realistic to consider um, undredging the system in some way, maybe over many decades. And that's the concept. Um, but but so we've learned, you know, I'll come to that later. We've learned that the historic, um, the 1870s hundred year flood is nothing like the modern day hundred year flood because you've cut off the floodplain and you've changed the inlet depth so dramatically. So um, the key conclusions in this paper from 2020 were that the total marsh habitat declined um, by about a, um, from 61 kilometers squared to 15. The intertidal unvegetated habitat never gets spoken of, but that similarly declined um, dramatically. Um, so the intertidals are mostly gone. Um, and that's the case across the whole harbor, of course. Um, and the landscape changes cause an increase of 28 centimeters in the 100 year storm tide or the 100 year flood. Um, and that's even larger than the influence of global sea level rise since the 1870s. Um, so extreme event flood risk has risen more due to landscape change than due to sea level rise but a similar magnitude basically. Um, and then high tide flooding in Jamaica Bay is also, this is a brand new paper from 2023. It just, just came out um, with a postdoc that worked with me. Um, so you can see the tides of the 1870s are in gray um, and the tides of the 2020s are in red. The tides of the 2020s have been raised up because of sea level rise, but they're also amplified. So you see the spring tide is dramatically about a foot. Um, it's about two feet higher than the spring tide was in the 1870s. And that's about half of that is due to sea level rise and land subsidence, and the other half due to the, in, the increased tide range. Um, we also had a Science Advances, a really top journal publication looking nationwide at um, tide gauges and estuaries. And we found that these changing tides, usually due to estuary urbanization practices, such as the dredging and the landfill, have increased US nuisance flooding by about 20%. Um, and that's over many different estuaries. And there's just a few cases where it's an extreme change like Jacksonville, Florida, Wilmington, uh, Miami actually has a lot more flooding than it would without, um, and you don't really hear about that, but we published a paper on that also. Um, of course, many of these are ports and I would never advocate that ports uh, are influent, you know, or undredged in any way, important ports um, because they're critical for jobs and for economic um, importance. So now uh, winding things down a little bit, I'll talk just about the potential um, solution that hasn't been studied, that, that um, could be studied by the core. Um, it may be too late, I don't know, but it's worth mentioning. Um, the current 100 year or 10 year return period flood shown here, it's actually somewhat similar, maybe a little bit worse than what happened on December 23rd. Um, has water levels about seven feet, uh, significant flooding on the Rockaways, Hamilton, Howard Beach. Um, and here it is, uh, if you, modify the bay by just undoing the dredging to where the channels are still all 20 feet deep uh, maximum. So you're not really dramatically changing the system. You're not dramatically shallowing um, the system, but it's a lot shallower than the 30 to 40 foot deep maximum depths that currently exist. And you also narrow uh, the inlet. This is really just early research and, and this just hasn't been followed up on, but it's very um, simple geometric work, I'm not designing um, ecosystems, but this can be complemented by having wetland restoration. It, it also, by, you know, and um, by, by increasing the amount of sediment in the system, you can make wetlands more resilient, uh, naturally resilient. Um, and I'll talk about the positives and negatives of it in sort of an objective way in a moment. Um, so relative, and then one last thought that I, I added this in actually this morning, an extreme shallowing where you shallow to six to 12 foot deep channels, um, relative to a future without action, the upland flood area is reduced by about 50%. Actually that last case, you eliminate the flooding um, completely during a 10 year return period flood. So there's no flooding on Rockaway, maybe a little bit of flooding at Howard Beach, but through a na nature-based solution. So when people say a nature-based solution can't reduce flooding, 
significantly. That's not always true. This is a case where we're demonstrating that a nature mimicking um, restorative solution could actually reduce flooding significantly. But it doesn't stop the 100 year flood, right? So that's critical, as mentioned by Bryce, for the Corps of Engineers mission. It reduces the 100 year flood by about two feet. This blue represents 60 centimeters, about two feet. One thing that's really impressive about it, it doesn't cause any induced flooding anywhere else. You're not doing anything to protect Coney Island. You don't need to raise your walls higher on Coney Island or Breezy Point. You're just having a, you're absorbing the flood, um, but reducing its speed, spreading it out in time, um, but you're not causing any induced flooding. So you don't need to solve problems up in, you know, East Harlem or other places. Um, and those aren't huge amounts of induced flooding that happen with the HATS tentatively selected plan. It might just be a foot of extra water or even just inches at East Harlem, you know, I'm not sure. But when you add up all these walls and all these barriers, it does end up being significant induced flooding at other places that aren't protected. And so in the TSP, there's, there's additional walls in those places. So um, as I mentioned, and as we heard earlier, you know, if this doesn't protect against the 100 year flood, does that mean it can't be utilized? That what was mentioned earlier was a 15 foot surge. To be exact, that's a 15 foot future base flood elevation at probably at 20, year 2100. So that's 10 foot, similar to Hurricane Sandy, 1% storm tide or 100 year storm tide. That's the 100 year flood. Plus three foot um, 99th percentile wave heights. That's how you define the base flood elevation or something like that. Um, and then plus two feet of sea level rise. Um, so any, you know, we've heard about hybrid solutions. I mean, this doesn't have to be the only thing. <laughs> you know, you don't have to stop the flood with nature based alone. Um, you could have other nature based solutions such as marshes and and this solution takes away two feet from that 15 feet, reducing the wave heights by having re replenished marsh islands and such, still advancing automatically. Um, those marshes can reduce the peak wave heights by a few, few more feet. You can have seawalls that might be another few feet high on the shorefronts. You could have building elevation like they did for the New Jersey back base study. They're, they're paying for building elevation, I, I believe, um, if they get authorized for the funding. Uh, you could have street elevations. I, I don't see why the Rockaway Peninsula couldn't have street elevations if it's so valuable to protect. Um, and lastly, you could have non-structural approaches or, you know, lastly, managed retreat is a possibility um, that could be explored. So, so a hybrid solution could be a, a more um, a way of doing this without without hard infrastructure in Jamaica Bay or without as much without blocking off the estuary. So finally, um, the challenges and the potential benefits of, of these large scale estuary scale nature based solutions. For Jamaica Bay, there's concern about polluted sediments being dumped in the bay because historically there apparently wasn't a case where they're looking at filling the borrow pits with polluted sediment. Um, or if you put in clean sand, you still could reintroduce the borrow pits pollutants that are at the bottom. Another concern is that the reduction in deep water habitat, if you're shallowing channels um, dramatically. I mean, 20 feet's not shallow, um, but if you're shallowing to the even shallower case, that could be a problem for straight bass fishing. Um, and the speed, I, you know, I think it's totally understandable, the speed of modification of the system or just of the benthic habitat, if we were to dump a lot of sediment in Jamaica Bay, could harm benthic organisms. What I'm proposing is, you know, you could potentially just take all the sediment that's being um, pulled out of Ambrose Channel every year, which is hundreds of thousands of cubic meters, cubic yards of sediment, and be pumping it to the inlet and allowing it to come in naturally uh, with the flood tide current. So it's not something that would be done over five years or 10 years. It could be something that could be done over, over decades. Um, and it could be complementary to storm surge, well, maybe not to storm surge barriers, but to other solutions, I think. Um, and then lastly, the availability of clean sediments offshore of the volume that would be needed, tens of millions of cubic yards is, is an important question, but this just hasn't been studied. So we don't know what, what of these concerns are really in the way of, of having these kinds of solutions for Jamaica Bay or for the Meadowlands for that matter. So the potential benefits apart from the flood risk reduction that, that I did, we have demonstrated in many studies um, is that it doesn't reflect floods out to other locations, no induced flooding. Um, you can have a self-sustaining natural sediment march system um, right now, the system is deemed to be unsustainable. At least most of the marshes don't have enough sedimentation on them because there's not much sediment in, in Jamaica Bay. And also in that Petite study and, and some other studies, it's been shown that a lot of the sediments end up in the deep channels during storms. And then water quality can be improved if you have um, our preliminary research showed a large reduction in hypoxic area. And that's mainly because you're just getting rid of these deep stagnant borrow pit zones. And when you shallow the water, then you're more likely to have aeration of the deeper water. 
Um, you can have increased intertidal habitat, so you're losing the deep water habitat, but you're, uh, you've got plentiful deep water habitat in the region. Um, you would get increased intertidal habitat, um, and that could be a positive. And lastly, you're avoiding temporary solutions to sea level rise, um, which is a long-term problem. So you're, you're not making this temporary solution that you're going to have to come back to in 50, 50 years or later this century to deal with. So my final conclusions, the water quality impacts of the HATS study tentatively selected plan are predicted to be low to moderate, but will be further studied. Impacts of marine organisms are poorly understood and still being quantified in the HATS study. Impacts of surge barriers generally scale with the frequency of closure. Um, sea level rise will eventually cause rising chronic flooding, and that will need to be addressed um, and could cause overuse of barrier closures. Nature-based solutions under HATS, um, a limited set of nature-based solutions was considered, and none were expected to significantly reduce storm surge. Most locations in New York, New Jersey Harbor, I agree, they cannot be protected using nature-based solutions alone. Um, and, and they will later be planned and evaluated for reducing small chronic floods and other co-benefits. Lastly, may, many stakeholders and residents prefer to see an exhaustive evaluation of nature-based solutions to flooding, which hasn't happened. Um, however, new estuary, uh, new ideas for estuary scale nature-based solutions have not been studied by the Corps and may be, be applicable for locations like the Meadowlands or Jamaica Bay. And I have references at the back of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philip, and we'll turn back to Pippa now. Thanks. All right, let's try to get this. Um, I'm actually really glad that Phil was able to go um, before me because I think he really provided a lot of um, some technical grounding um, for some of the pieces that I'm gonna share. I would also like to say that um, we are a little behind on time, so I might rush through some things, but I did um, put a lot of um, links and labels into what I did. Um, so I'm really building on what the session three group, particularly Luce, talked about, as well as what Phil did to really um, try to talk about how we how we integrate nature into adapted shorelines and some of the measures that we've talked about and give you some, some visual examples from elsewhere, but also right here in New York City um, and talk, I'm really going to be focused on things that are really appropriate to our sort of unique and urbanized shoreline of the New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary. I think it's important that we start by talking about just what are natural and nature-based solutions um, or natural and nature-based features. And I, I point to the Army Corps definition because this is the Army Corps study. And I would say in addition to the HATS study, um, another uh, document that came out this year was this over the international guidelines on natural and nature-based features. This is like a 600 page document about these published by the Army Corps Engineering with Nature. And I think is a really great resource if you want to learn more. But when we talk about this, these are, these are, are, are and these are natural features that are created by nature, but also nature-based features that are engineered by people to sort of mimic natural processes, but um, distinct from just other natural features or, or restoration, we're really talking about those that can produce flood risk management as well as benefits as well as others. So we're really looking at these natural or nature-like systems for how they reduce flooding um, on top of the other ecosystem or human benefits. One of the things is, you know, the Army Corps has done a great job of defining these, but like everybody has different definitions. So, you know, some, but we're all kind of coming around to this, this common understanding. Um, there's, there's a lot of different definitions out there and I just want everybody to be aware of that. Um, and so as Luce presented, there's a range of things that we might call nature-based features from natural systems that we see to sort of enhancement of hard structural features. And as, as Luce, Justine, Edgar all talked about, they have different benefits and different impacts for flood risk reduction, the environment, ecosystems, and biodiversity, people, quality of life, economy, culture, environmental justice. And we have to consider our priorities and discuss those trade-offs. Um, as has been said, many nature-based features work by um, you know, reducing waves um, and don't necessi won't necessarily address that 100 year storm, but maybe you want to address that 100 year storm through retreat or home elevation. These are trade offs and different features do different things. So some of the questions that people ask was what are the extent that these can be used to help build flood protection in the region? What types of NNBF are feasible for our community? And the lens that I kind of want to look at this through is how might natural and nature-based features be integrated into the HATS proposal? What are the places 
four natural and nature-based features there. And I think that was introduced by the Colonel earlier that, as, and Phil alluded to, the Corps has looked at a lot of different measures throughout and the primary components of the HATS proposal are not the natural and nature-based features because of that um, assessment of their ability to address the 100-year storm, but how can they be integrated to, into some of those me measures or layered on to use um, to use uh, to use to to make this to help some of those features? And I'm going to talk about a, a few ways. So one is to enhance for people for habitat the existing measures. And Luce talked a little bit about this, but what I mean by here is integrating natural features and engineered features that enhance the shore-based measures that that. Um, and risk reduction measures that the core is included. And what this does is it creates habitat, supports biodiversity, it can help offset environmental impacts of hard structures um, and provide a range of ecosystem benefits. Um, an example project that I think is a good reference to conceptually understand what we mean by this is the Central Seawall Project in Seattle. Seattle had to replace their seawall, um, but they were very concerned about migratory salmon, right? And so they built in features, you see these textured, um, walls, you see light penetration, you see a high um, deck that allows for light to get in and, and light to penetrate through. More light and these textured complex surfaces in the inner tidal and shallow tidal sub zones are things that a lot of a, that attract aquatic species. This was designed specifically for salmon, but many of these principles are true for fish in our harbor, um, but they would be neat to thought about. But you can walk around New York City and see some of these measures in place. This is a, um, an inst installation on at the end of one Huron Street in Brooklyn, where we've incorporated a project that often did it, where we incorporated some ecological measures with revetment. You know, there wasn't an enough space, there wasn't a decision to use um, a, a living shoreline or something here, but if you can incorporate those ecological measures. Um, we're doing the same on our Living Breakwaters project, which is more of a nature-based feature, but it, it highlights some of the ways that hard structural features can actually provide habitat. We're seeing a lot of growth of, of um, or underground or of in, vertebrate organisms that are then attracting juvenile fish and other things already, even though it's already under construction. So there are, even in these hard measures, and this is a rendering from the Financial District Seaport Climate Master Plan um, that came out through EDC that talks about, okay, we're you're building this, this large shore-based measure, but here are ways that we can integrate public access and integrate um, habitat features too. So there are ways that these can be layered that, that can be integrated into the hard structural features. Now, the other uh, aspect is layering natural and nature-based features onto those shore-based measures um, to reduce waves, or as Phil just alluded to, even reduce surge. And these include things like living shorelines as well as restoring natural systems. And these have many of the similar benefits, but they also can tend to be used to reduce erosion and wave action. So don't lose those onshore features that you already have. It can help reduce the height of onshore features and related to that often the, the cost and help preserve the natural shorelines that we already have. And so, you know, what does it look like or feel like to layer these up? This is a project um, in Norfolk, Virginia that layers a flood protection Um, that layers a living shoreline in front of a flood de defense berm or levee that's designed to keep surge out. So, you know, when we when we think about these, these can go together, and the living shoreline helps reduce the exposure and erosion, and to some degree even the the height of that levee. But you can see they had a fair amount of space. Um, it's not a lot of space. This is pretty dense, but there's a lot of areas in um, you know in New York where we don't have that. Um, the another example of how sort of these nature-based features, like um, these are living breakwaters, not a living revetment, um, that are uh, that are being constructed offshore of Staten Island, a project that SCAPE um, is doing for the New York op State Office, Governor's Office of Storm Recovery, along with engineering partners like COE and Arcadis. Um, but these are designed to reduce waves before they um, hit, hit land so that um, the onshore, the beach, and the dunes remain and can keep structures um, from the beach from further eroding and can keep structures on shore from being exposed to wave attack and that erosion. But as we've talked about, these 
these breakwaters, like many natural nature-based features, they reduce erosion, they lessen wave impacts, they provide habitat, um, they allow for that the, the beach to build back to not have structures on shore and, and to be there, but they don't keep the flood water out. So um, we like to say they have to be layered. Um, it has to be partnered with a layered approach of onshore um, home elevation of berms or dunes, depending on what your priorities are, um, and begin to sort of build up a culture of resilience there. And so this idea of layering is something that you can think about when you look at the different um, proposed shore-based measures and risk reduction measures in the HATS proposal um, that are designed against that larger storm. How might these outboard measures be layered on them to make that space more, um, the, the shoreline more amenable to, um, to habitat and to other species, um, to human use and recreation. Um, and so there's there's many, you know, this is happening around our harbor. So if you wanna look at what some of these measures look like and feel like and the space they take up, um, you can go to Jamaica Bay. Um, you can look in Brooklyn Bridge Park, right? And I think one of the things is these these all has been alluded to a couple of times, these require different amounts of space. And so how do we design these measures for different conditions? They look different in different conditions and they have different risk reduction and habitat benefits. And a lot of that is related to the space that you have for the shoreline. So it's slightly more condensed, but you also see it's more, it's harder. Um, you know, up in Hunters Point South Queens, layers this elevated park with a constructed wetland that again, um, you know, provides this um, natural benefit, but also access. Um, but there's also these, I wanna share some of these other narrow urban um, shorelines that you see along like Harlem River Park or what's being built at Gansevoort Peninsula in Manhattan. So, you know, look at, look at these places, visit these places, see what they look and feel like. These are ways that um, nature-based features could be layered with, um, you know, layered with, uh, um, HATS proposals to do this. And I, I talked sort of conceptually about how living breakwaters work. This is an example from actually Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I think it illustrates some of the points that um, Phil talked about where this was a project that said, oh, you know, we need to raise this road. We need to create a berm. We need to keep the water out, but, you know, let's put a living shoreline on. That's what people want. But what it did, and this is this little graph, I'll call your attention to the little graph on the right. These are the wave heights with and without um, the living shoreline. And because that berm or that seawall is dependent not only just on that still water surge elevation, but those waves, those layering, those nature-based solutions can actually often provide benefits to, to help lower the height of the wall. And maybe that doesn't, maybe it's just a couple inches, maybe it's a couple feet, but if that's the difference between people seeing over that wall or not, or helping you get ADA access over it, that can be a big deal. So that's just one way that they can be combined. Um, another way, you know, while I said most of them deal with waves and erosion, but as Phil alluded to, and this is really um, here to speak to it, um, he, he spoke about there at the end of his presentation is at a large scale, um, this approach of reviving estuary scale nature-based systems um, can even lower surge impacts. Um, and I, you know, you could think about this as, as nature-based or think about this as restoration, but I think it's slightly different than traditional restoration in um, something that Phil highlighted where these often these um, conditions, we've altered our estuaries and the waterways so much that, you know, what are we restoring to? We're not actually sort of going back to a historic um, restoration, but creating something new and really thinking about, you know, not only how is that going to help now the habitat, but how is that going to help us manage um, flood risk and maybe reduce onshore surge and erosion. Um, and so, you know, things are happening at this scale in our region, um, in Jamaica Bay, the Marsh Island restoration um, that, that the Army Corps is doing, um, and that the Army Corps Philadelphia district is doing a lot in Barnegat Bay. Um, I'd be remiss not to mention the Meadowlands restoration work, right? So there, are, there is this large scale um, work that's going on and should be thought of in the context of the HAT study. Um, this is, I'll, I'll skip through it because this is basically what Phil talked about, the modeling in Jamaica Bay. But just to say, just to illustrate that this isn't a one-off, we similarly um, in, in this area in Boston, Massachusetts, along the Neponset River, another tidally constrained estuary with wetlands, looked at 
um, the difference in storm surge extent between if those wetlands um, were allowed to keep up with sea level, were managed to keep up with sea level rise versus flooded, and it had a small impact in the extent of flooding. Now that extent of flooding was small, but it was the difference between a transit rail station flooding and not. And so that can matter. So I think these are just, this is a way of thinking about some of the efforts that Bill and the others have discussed about how they might layer on with some of the shore-based measures that are in the HAT study. Um, the last thing that I want to mention is preserve and restore natural features. <laughs> um, in all of our conversation about um, creating new uh, living shorelines and nature-based features. I think we also want to make sure we're preserving the healthy ecosystems that we do have and restoring. Um, and I want to highlight that this is happening all around the harbor. So um, do read the environmental impacts sections of, um, of the HAT study and think about, you know, the wetlands. We, you know, we live in a very urbanized area. We've lost a huge amount of wetlands, but we do have a lot of wetlands and they are providing ecosystem services for us, including re um, reduction benefits, our, our existing wetlands, our existing beaches. And so some of these resources like the wetland management framework for New York City that parks put out, but maybe first and foremost, um, the Hudson Raritan Estuary Comprehensive Restoration Plan, um, which is a joint plan of the Army Corps and the Port Authority, which identifies restoration priorities. So thinking about how these restoration priorities work could work hand in hand is, um, is, is a great opportunity. Um, and some projects around are doing that. So um, one of the things that people asked about is erosion. And um, I'm just gonna ask, you know, Amy, should I just kind of skip this or should I try to go through it in like two minutes and just give people a... I think um, if you can, this is Terry. Yeah, if you can do a quick version, we okay. can manage the questions yeah. at the end, thanks. Cool. This, um, so, it, this is a little bit of a shift, but I also, so finally, I want, I do want to say I did not talk about inland green infrastructure for stormwater management. Um, given the time, this really was focused on coastal. That is critical. It's important. Um, it was not left out because it's not important, but just given our time and focus today. So um, one of the things that people asked about was um, erosion and how, how do hard features impact erosion. I am not a coastal engineer, but I have worked with a lot of amazing coastal engineers. So I'm I'm going to share um, what I learned from them over the years, and they can correct me in the Q and A's um, if anyone does. So, you know, typically we sort of exist with a shoreline. Um, we have tides that go up and down. We have wave action, and wave action tends to generate erosion. It tends to generate two types of erosion, where the waves, which are just day to day waves, break on shore, and um, and they don't always come into the shore perpendicular. Um, they come at an angle, and if that angle is tr is dominantly in one direction, they're going to pull sand on and off the shore and start to move sand. And there's typically a dominant direction, and that's called longshore transport, moving sand up or down the beach. And so, when you put in hard structures, typically like groins, but anything that's hard or even an outfall, um, you tend to get sediment buildup where it stops that movement and then erosion on the downside. So erosion is a natural process, but when we put in um, hardened structures, it tends to sort of cause, um, cause sand to build up or accrete in one area and erode in another. Um, and you can see this when you're out on the shore, but that's just the principle for sort of how any of these structures that stick out into the water will impact that. The other type of erosion that is naturally occurring, particularly on beaches and soft shorelines, are when waves um, uh, come up on the beach during a storm, they tend to erode features like our dune faces, and that's why dunes tend to move naturally. Um, I'll skip this. But when we put a hardened structure, you still have that wave action and it can tend to erode um, the, 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 the bottom and base of that structure and, and gradually erode uh, intertidal or shallow subtidal areas in front of those hard structures. So we tend, um, they can, when you're talking about a, a bulkhead, a seawall that extends into the water, um, eliminate and damage and erode those natural systems like wetlands or beaches. Um, this is just illustrating how that works. Um, and, and you know, you see that, right? These are sort of temporary dunes after Sandy and this is why the sand goes away. Um, so um, that's just a quick note on erosion. I'll turn it over. I've just left some resources right here at the end where folks can uh, learn more with links. Um, Army Corps Engineering with Nature, 
New Jersey and New York State's resources, um, and the New York City one that I mentioned. So thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Pippa. Thank you, Phil. Um, we've got some questions in the Q&A. Um, there's one, Phil, that uh, I'll pull out right away if you can give a very short summary response uh, for everybody in addition to what you put in the chat. Um, and the question is really about the change in, uh, in flow and the Jamaica Bay example when the gates are opened that the flow could be up to two times uh, what it is without the gates, in addition to any potential impacts on, uh, on wildlife, on species. Um, can you speak very quickly to potential changes in uh, loss of marshlands? Um, and uh, would the open gates exacerbate marsh loss? Um, and then you also spoke a little bit about intertidal, the intertidal zone and intertidal habitat loss, if you can address that quickly for the whole group. Sure. Uh, as, as I showed, Jamaica Bay's lost a lot of its intertidal habitat. It's lost 70, 75% of it, about 75% of its wetlands. Um, there's some debate, I think, still whether or not, you know, some, some of the marshes in Jamaica Bay, like Joko, may still be rising quickly enough from sedimentation on top of them to keep up with sea level rise, but many of them are not. Um, so a lot of the marshes are still aren't really sustainable, but they're being rebuilt in a lot of cases. So we're kind of moving toward more of a curated garden of wetlands um, in the long run at, at the rate we're going. And the surge barrier system, you know, may reduce the sediment import into the bay. That's one thing that was suggested yesterday by Dave Ralston in his Hudson River Foundation talk, where he did modeling of, of a Hudson barrier and showed how there's a lot of scour within kilometers and really sediments going in other directions away from a, a, a barrier location. Um, and with Jamaica Bay, you need an import of sediment. It was shown by Bob Chant and others at Rutgers um, and Dave Ralston also on that paper a few years ago that you need to import sediment into Jamaica Bay through the inlet. So. He, he thought, I, I think it was what he said, that there is a chance that it'll reduce the import of sediment into the bay. But, you know, my sense is a lot of that sediment just stays on the bottom of these deep channels already. So it might not make things any worse. Um, and, and then there's a paper by Tognan and others about the Venice Lagoon where they sort of lay out this concern, this broad concern that if you're reliant on storms at a coastal tidal wetland, if you're reliant on storms to inundate the wetland, the flooding might be important to the wetlands because it drops sediment on top of the wetlands. So that might be an important factor that could be lost that helps those wetlands rise with, with sea level rise because they need to be building building land up. So that sedimentation from flooding could be something that, that could be missed. So that could be a problem. But it's still all work in progress and a, and a complicated topic. Terrific, thank you very much. Um, and on a, on a different tack, there's a question here that's really about governance. Um, and who makes the decision to close gates? How does that operate um, in, other, in other places where gates have been used? Um, what does that decision-making process look like? And who's, who's making the, the decision ultimately? I'll just give a brief answer that that depends on what country you're in, um, I believe. But, but I think, um, and the Corps of Engineers could speak to this later, or maybe they can join in or type in the chat. I don't know exactly what the procedure will be here. Um, I think that you have rules in advance There's a trigger. What, what I know of it is that there's a trigger water level. Um, and if the water level might hit that um, one year return period flood, there's a chance. Um, and maybe there's some uncertainty of the forecast in that. I'm, I'm not sure. It's not mentioned in the, the uh, Corps report. But, um, you know, if, if it might flood to that level, that's the trigger water level, then they'll close the barriers. And that's predetermined and it might get changed. You know, the Corps did a good job of showing how, acknowledging how in future decades, because of sea level rise, you, you, you know, you'd have to close the barrier more and more frequently. And so they might have to raise that trigger water level, which means you're not gonna close the barrier at seven feet anymore. You'll let people flood or you'll have to have some preparation to where there's already some other solution on the waterfronts um, for, for that flooding. That If you're not gonna close it every month in 2080, that you'll need to, to raise that trigger water yeah. level. I think that's an important thing to acknowledge about the, the surge barriers. Um, and it is addressed in the HAT study. The Corps can probably talk about it more, but if you if you dig in, um, they talk about future closures, right? So if you um, say, oh, don't want only want to close a surge barrier X number of times a year, um, you set a trigger water level, as Phil says. But as sea level rises, you're going to hit that trigger water level more often. And so it's a trade-off between 
what the water level is that you close it and how frequently you close it because you don't want to be closing it every day or every month. That's when you start to see, that's when you really could start to see environmental impacts, right? Um, and so it's important to remember if you're in a low-lying area that's protected by those surge barriers um, that at some point, you know, if you're very low lying, um, you might be dealing with um, reoccurring flooding and that those are those additional risk reduction measures um, that the HAT study shows behind the, the barriers. But it's also, I think, a, a place and opportunity maybe to talk about retreat um, or, and, and other adaptation approaches. Great. Thank you both. Um, we are unfortunately out of time for this session. There is a short lunch break um, that's happening now before the, the next uh, session at two o'clock. Um, I will encourage everybody, if you haven't done so already, to please put your any remaining questions in the Q&A. And we are collecting all of those and we'll be sure to uh, or try our best to address them um, even after today's session. And with that, um, thank you again, Pippa and Phil, um, for your wonderful insights and answers to questions. Um, I think we're all learning a lot here um, all day. And with that, I think we're moving to a break. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>